Well, greetings, everyone. This is the next to last study together. I think it's been a good journey. I've enjoyed my time here getting acquainted with new people and uh, enjoying the cool weather that you've been having here. It is cool when in Fresno it is 105. So, um, but it's a lot uh, drier in Fresno. It's like desert heat. So you don't feel it as much as you do here uh, in Oklahoma. Well, this afternoon we are going to study the cure for Laodicea's disease. But before we do this, we want to uh, have a word of prayer and then we'll do some review and we'll get into new territory. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, it's not a thing of pride to belong to the Laodicean church, but we do. The good news is that you have a, pu a cure for the disease of Laodicea. And as we study about the cure that you have, we ask that you will speak to each individual mind and heart that we might apply the cures that you have for the deadly disease of which Laodicea suffers. We thank you for the promise of your presence and we claim that promise in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, first of all, let's review what we studied in our first uh, presentation about the church of Laodicea. Last time, we studied about Laodicea's disease. And we noticed that Laodicea does the right things for the wrong reason. In other words, they do things to impress men and to impress God and earn the favor of God. The outside looks good, but there are deep problems on the inside. Laodicea has form and theory of the truth, but it is just a form of godliness without the power thereof. Laodicea has rituals and beliefs, nothing wrong with the rituals and beliefs, but the problem is that behind those rituals and reliefs, uh, beliefs there is no power. Jesus and Laodicea look at each other differently. Laodicea thinks she's rich, that she has 20-20 vision, and that she is luxuriously clothed and super happy. Jesus says, no, Laodicea, you've got it all wrong. Instead of being rich, you're poor. Instead of seeing 20-20, you're blind. Instead of being luxuriously clothed, you are naked. And instead of being happy, you are absolutely miserable. In other words, Laodicea, you are self-deceived. I read a statement this morning from volume 3 of the Testimonies, page 252, where Ellen White wrote, The message of the true witness finds the people of God in a sad deception, yet honest in that deception. They know not that their condition is deplorable in the sight of God. And that's why God gives the Laodicean message, so that Laodicea will no longer be in a sad deception and honest in that deception. Now, how do we convince one who is sick but doesn't think that they are sick, to seek treatment. It is virtually an impossibility. And that is the problem with Laodicea. So God does not mince any words when it comes to the condition of the Laodicean church. He tells it like it is, and the reason why is because He wants Laodicea to see its disease and to seek for the remedy for that disease. In volume 4 of the Testimonies, page 87, Ellen White wrote, The only hope for the Laodiceans is a clear view of their standing before God, a knowledge of the nature of their disease. So the only hope for Laodicea is to realize the disease that Laodicea has. Now the question is, what has God prescribed from the divine pharmacy, so to speak? for the disease of the church of Laodicea. He has actually recommended three medicines. Now they might be bitter, 
but they will bring healing. The first of these is gold tried in the fire. The second remedy is white garments that Laodicea might be clothed. And the third is eye salve that Laodicea might see. So the gold that she might be rich, the garments so that she might be clothed, and the eye salve so that she can see. Let's talk first of all about the gold tried in the fire. What does the gold tried in the fire represent? We're going to read a series of verses now that tell us what is represented by the gold. Go with me if you have your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. Here we find clearly explained what the gold is. The Apostle Paul wrote, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. So the gold tried in the fire represents faith that works by love. You see the Pharisees had lots of works, but the works were not the product of love. The gold represents works that are work that work uh, because they come from a heart of love and they come as a result of faith. Actually true and pure religion has two dimensions. Those two dimensions are found in James chapter 1 and verse 27. James chapter 1 verse 27. Here uh, the, the brother of Jesus, James, wrote the following words. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Is that all? No. You know, practical godliness, visit the fatherless and the widows, that is, the destitute of society? No, because the second half says, and to keep himself, what? Unspotted from the world. In other words, it's doing good works, at the same time refraining from becoming contaminated by the world. Let's notice 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 17 through 19. We're still speaking about the gold tried in the fire. Here the Apostle Paul is going to once again discuss what true faith is all about. It's a faith that works by love. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they may be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they, now notice this, that they what? Do good, not believe good, that they do good, that they may be rich in what? So what does the gold represent? It represents good works, but they are true good works because they come from faith and they come from a motivation of love. So how is that manifested? That they be rich in good works, ready to what? To distribute, that is to give, willing to communicate, line up a store for themselves, a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So once again we find here that the true riches are good works that distribute, that communicate, and that give. But they are works that are produced by faith. They are not simply dead works. Now of course the place where we really want to go and dwell some, uh, dwell some time in uh, this particular chapter is James chapter 2. Because there the Apostle James writes about the relationship between faith and works. So let's go to James chapter 2 and we'll read verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in what? Rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them 
that love him. Now that's an important verse. What are we supposed to be rich in? We are to be rich in faith and that is manifested in love for God because the last part of the verse says he hath promised to them that love him. Now were the people that James wrote to practicing what James wrote about? Absolutely not. Notice James chapter 2 and verses 14 through 17. Now we're going to see why he said here in this verse, you know, that we need to be rich in faith, but it is a faith that works by love. In James chapter 2 we have a problem that James presents that the church has had that he wrote to. I read verse 14, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, that word say is very important, does he really have faith? No. Though a man say he hath faith, and have not works, can faith save him? Really what it's saying is, can such a faith save him? And then what is he talking about? It's faith that works by love. Notice verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Are you seeing that this is practical Christianity that is being spoken of here? The people that James wrote to, they said, we have great faith, but needy people would come into the congregation that needed food, that needed clothing, and they said, go home and dress appropriately to come to church, and go and have breakfast before you come to church. And these were the people who said they had faith. They had a faith that did not work, which is really not faith. Now God saves us by grace through faith alone, but the faith that saves never is alone. Amen. James chapter 2 and verse 18, yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. And then James says, Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. In other words, how is faith revealed? Faith is revealed in works. What kind of works? Works of love. Works of love. In other words, a person who truly has faith will produce works of love to benefit those who are in dire need. Notice James chapter 2 and verse 18 once again. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Let's go to verse 19. You know, the word faith, as it's being used of, uh, by James, describing the people that he wrote to, is really an intellectual belief, like Laodicea has. In other words, it's something that they only have in the brain. It's actually an intellectual assent to truth. It's a mental belief in the truth that is not translated into action. Notice James chapter 2 verse 19. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Is it important to believe that there's one God? Yes. Of course, you do well. But now notice this. Even the demons believe and tremble. Do you think that Satan believes that Jesus is coming again? Do you think Satan believes that the Sabbath is the proper day of rest? Do you believe that Satan uh, believes that uh, Jesus died on the cross? And that he resurrected? And that he's interceding in heaven? and that the investigative judgment began October 22, 1844, the devil believes all of that. And yet it's not going to save him, because his belief is simply a mental intellectual belief that is not translated into good doing. In fact, all he does with people is evil. In other words, the word faith is an action word. In the Greek language, the word faith is pistis, 
and the Greek word, the verbal form, is pistuo. It is an action word. It really should be translated trust rather than just faith because, uh, or believe. It's the same word that appears in John 3 verse 16 where it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him. And so people think, oh I just have to believe that Jesus came to this world, He died on the cross, He resurrected, and He went to heaven. Hallelujah, I'm saved. Really it should say that everyone who trusts in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's go to James 2 verses 20 and 21. But do you want to know, O foolish man, <laughs> interesting how he wrote, person who he says he has faith but doesn't have works is what? Foolish. O foolish man, that faith without works is what? Is dead? Was, was not Abraham our father, now this is a controversial statement, justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Wow. Abraham was justified by what? By works. Now wait a minute, didn't the Apostle Paul say that uh, Abraham was justified by faith? So here we have a contradiction in the Bible, don't we? Paul says it's by faith and James says it's by works. How do you reconcile those two ideas? We are going to take a look at that. But let me just give you uh, an anticipation of what is happening here. Paul is telling us how a person is saved. He's saved by grace through faith. And James says, hallelujah, a faith that works. Because a faith that does not work is not faith. Are you with me? So James is not fighting with the Apostle Paul. He's saying, yeah Paul, you're right. We're justified by grace through faith, but it's a true faith, and a true faith does what? A true faith works. If you don't believe that, just notice Hebrews 11, the great chapter of faith. You know that that's the great chapter of faith, right? Yes. Have you ever noticed that in Hebrews 11, people aren't only believing something, they're really doing something. God says to Noah, Noah, there's going to be a flood. And Noah says, thank you God for this revelation, now I'll sit down and I'll watch. No, God says to Noah what? Build a boat! Build a boat and get in the boat. Faith acted by building a boat. He says to Moses, Moses instead of choosing the treasures of Egypt, I want you to go out with this rebellious people that are going to be criticizing you all the time. What did Moses do? He left. He acted upon it. Let me ask you, what did Abel do? He offered a sacrifice and so on. Enoch walked with God. We already talked about what it means to walk with God. It means to have similar conduct to God. And so in Hebrews 11 faith is an action word. It's not something you believe in your head, it's something yes that you have in your head, but it's translated into action. Works by love. Amen. So James chapter 2 verse 22 says, Do you see that faith was working together with His works? And by works faith was made perfect. In other words, faith without works is imperfect. By the way the word perfect here really means incomplete. Now when you open a door let me ask you which of the two sides moves first? The inside or the outside? <laughs> they both move together, don't they? When you start your car in the morning, and by the way this is on a good day when the road is clear, and you put your car in drive, and your car is a back wheel drive, which of the two wheels move first, the front wheels or the back wheels? <laughs> Lots of people say, well, you know, when I don't tell them whether it's front or rear, rear wheel drive, they say, well, is it front wheel or rear wheel drive? <laughs> it makes no difference. When the rear wheels move, the front wheels follow instantly. Where there is faith, there is work. Ellen White compared faith and works with two oars of a boat. Let me ask you, which oar is more important, the right oar or the left oar? <laughs> well, if you have the left oar, you're going to go in circles to the left. Right. If you have the left oar, you're going to go in circles to the right. You have to have faith and works together to advance in spiritual life. Amen. Let me ask you this, I want to give you a little, a little um, thing to do. See this little piece of paper? I'd like one of you to come and take one side off of the paper. 
Just one side. Can you take one side off of a paper? Well, you can peel it, but it still has two sides. Faith and works, they go together. You cannot have one without having the other. It's an impossibility. Let's go to James 2 verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. What happened when God called Abraham and Abraham was willing to offer his own son, he acted in other words upon his faith. What did God say that Abraham was? He was his friend. This reminds me of John chapter 15 and verse 14 where Jesus said, You are my friends if you do what I command you. So James was a friend, a, a friend of God, Abraham was a friend of God because they did what God commanded them to do. Faith acted in works. Notice James chapter 2 and verse 24. Here James states, you see, that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now we need to understand that James is not saying that you're justified by works in the sense that many people believe. What he's saying is that you are justified by a faith that works which is the only genuine kind of faith. Amen. By the way the Apostle Paul also has much to say in his epistles about works. And uh, let me just uh, say this for a moment here, this is very important. The Apostle Paul uses the expression very frequently, works of law. Man is not justified by the works of the law. Listen, works of the law is a negative term in itself. In the writings of the Apostle Paul, works of the law by definition are works that a person performs in order to be saved. In other words, they are bad works. When the Apostle Paul uses the word, the expression works of law, He's speaking about evil works because they are works that are performed like Laodicea does, like the Pharisees did, in order to earn salvation and in order to be seen by human beings. And of course Martin Luther, he did not like the book of James. He called it the epistle of straw because uh, you know he was in a great battle with the Roman Catholic Church which was a very works centered church. Let's not be too hard on Luther because he was fighting against a deadly enemy and that was that, that works are meritorious, that you can be saved by your pilgrimages and by doing this and by doing that, by lighting candles, by going and confessing to a priest. So Luther just could not understand what the perspective of James was. You see Paul was struggling against those who believed that faithless works can save them, whereas James was struggling against those who were saying that a workless faith could save them. Let's go to James chapter 2 and verse 25. Here James is going to give another example. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? What does this say? That Rahab was justified by what? Works. By works. Was she really justified by works? No. She was justified by a faith that works. God had said that He was going to destroy Jericho. Was that the most ridiculous thing in the world if you lived in Jericho at that time? Of course. I mean Jericho was a city walled to the heavens, it says in the book of Joshua. And so the, the spies come and they say, the city, God is going to destroy the city. Instead of saying, yeah right, she believed God and she hid the spies and she sent the spies out on another way. Her faith was shown by her works. She really believed that the city was going to be destroyed even though it appeared like it was an impossibility. She not only believed in her head, she acted on her belief by hiding the spies and sending them out another way. And then comes the conclusion in James 2.26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Let me ask you what's more important? Your body or your spirit? What's more important, your body or your spirit? Can your body function without the spirit? Can the spirit function without the body? No, you have to have both of them together. You see, Paul and James are not fighting each other. 
Paul and James are simply giving two different dimensions of salvation. Paul is saying yes we're saved by grace through faith, but James is saying true faith will be manifested in works, and if it doesn't manifest itself in works of love, it is not genuine faith, it is incomplete, just like your body without the Spirit would be incomplete. Amen. I want to read you this statement from the Spirit of Prophecy, it's found in volume 1 of Selected Messages, page 398. Grace is unmerited favor, and the believer is justified without any merit of his own, without any claim to offer God. He is justified through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who stands in the courts of heaven as the sinner's substitute and surety. However, while he is justified because of the merit of Christ, he is not free to work on righteousness. Faith works by love and purifies the soul. Amen. Faith buds and blossoms and bears a harvest of precious fruit. Where faith is, good works appear. Amen. And what are those good works? The sick are visited, the poor are cared for, the fatherless and the widows are not neglected, the naked are clothed, the destitute are fed. Christ went about doing good, and when men are united with Him, they love the children of God, and meekness and truth guide their footsteps. Isn't that a beautiful statement? A very balanced statement. She says we're saved by grace through faith, but she says that grace that saves us comes into our heart, and as a result we practice practical godliness benefiting and helping others. Now the second remedy for Laodicea besides a faith that works by love are white garments. So let's pursue what the white garments represent. Adam and Eve in their innocent state wore no artificial garments. They were covered with a garment of light, the light that covers God because they reflected the glory of God. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25 we are told, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. But then Adam and Eve sinned, and what was the first result of Adam and Eve's sin? They lost their robe of light, and now they realize that they are naked, and they're embarrassed because they know that their relationship with God has been broken. So somehow they have to solve this problem of nakedness, and so they decide they're going to go the way of the Pharisee. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7, we are told, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So they cover themselves with fig leaves. Now, it's interesting that after this God comes to the garden, He says, Adam, where are you? At this point when God calls, they already have the fig leaves covering their nakedness, but they still feel naked. Notice Genesis 3 verse 10, so He said, this is Adam speaking to God, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. They knew that the fig leaves could not cover the nakedness of sin. What does a garment represent in Scripture? What are our garments that we use to cover our nakedness? What do they represent? Isaiah 64 and verse 6 has the answer, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness says, another translation say, our righteous actions are like filthy rags. So in other words, the garments of, uh, made of fig leaves represent our attempt of covering the shame of our nakedness, and we can't do that. How did God cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve? Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21 tells us. It says there, unto Adam and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of polyester? No. <laughs> oh, 
I'm going to have to get new glasses. <laughs> Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord, Lord make garments of cotton. No, garments of what? Skin. Coats of skins and clothe them. Now what needs to happen in order to get the skin of an animal? The animal must be killed. What did those animals represent? Because it's skins, plural. There were Adam and Eve. What do they represent? The death of Jesus Christ, which covers the shame of our nakedness. There was a death in the garden that day, which represented the death of Christ, which will cover the shame of our nakedness. In fact, Isaiah 61 verse 10 tells us that the robe represents the robe of righteousness. Let's read that, Isaiah 61 verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. Do you know at what moment Jesus covers with us with His robe of righteousness? It is at the moment that we're baptized. At that moment when we confess our sins and the sins are buried in the baptismal waters, at that time we put on the garment of Christ's righteousness. Notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So when a person comes forth from the baptistry, in the, from the waters where they were buried, they come forth covered with the robe of Christ's righteousness. But there's more to the story. You see there's a robe of justification and that robe of justification includes also the robe of sanctification. Notice Revelation chapter 19 and verses 7 and 8. You see when you're truly sorry for sin and your sins are buried in the waters of baptism, you will despise and hate sin and you will want to overcome and you will beg Jesus to give you victory over sin. Revelation chapter 19 verses 7 and 8, Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. Now notice, fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. I'm reading now from the New International Version. And then in parentheses in the NIV you have the fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Now you say, wait a minute, doesn't the, the robe represent the righteousness of Christ? Yes, it represents the righteousness of Christ manifested in righteous acts on the part of His people. Let's go to Romans chapter 10 and verse 3. Here we have a diagnosis of the problem that existed in the days of Christ with the Jews. Romans chapter 10 and verse 3 says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. What was their problem? They wanted to establish their own righteousness, instead of manifesting in their lives the righteousness of God. Now I'm going to read a rather lengthy statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. It's found in that magnificent book, Christ's Object Lessons, page 311 and 312. This robe, and you're going to see the relationship between justification and sanctification. Justification is when we receive Jesus, when we repent of sin and we confess to Him, at that moment Jesus takes His life and His death and He places them to our account. That's justification. And God looks upon us as if we had never sinned. But that is not unrelated to sanctification. Notice how Ellen White relates both of these. This robe, woven in the lo loom of heaven, has in it not one thread of human devising. Christ in His humanity wrought a, out a perfect character, and this character He offers to impart to us. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Everything that we ourselves can do is defiled by sin. However, the Son of God was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin. Sin is defined to be transgression of the law. However, Christ was obedient to every, every requirement of the law. He said of Himself, I delight to do Thy will, O my God, yea, Thy law is within my heart. When on earth He said to His disciples, I have kept my Father's commandments. 
by his perfect obedience, listen carefully, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. And now comes the secret. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Isn't that interesting? Then as the Lord looks upon us he sees not the fig leaf garment nor the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. This, uh, this garment of Christ's righteousness is produced by him, is given by him. The problem with the Pharisees is that they covered themselves with the robe of their own righteousness and their own works. They were disconnected with Christ. Now the third remedy that we find for Laodicea is the eye salve. The eye salve represents spiritual discernment because Laodicea uh, has problems with the eyes. She sees herself as being perfect but really her eyes are deceiving her. Notice Matthew chapter 15 and verse 14. Jesus said about the religious leaders of his day, leave them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both of them will fall into a ditch. In Matthew chapter 23, and I'll just mention the verses, verses 16, 17, 19, 24, and 26, five times Jesus refers to the religious leaders of his day as blind guides. In John chapter 9 we have the healing of the man who was born blind. You know at the end of the story Jesus said something very interesting. It's found in verse 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see. He's referring to the man who was blind. And he's not talking about physical eyesight. He's talking about the fact that this man discerned him as the Messiah. Whereas those who claimed to see the scribes and Pharisees were blind because they did not realize that Jesus was the Messiah. So once again, and Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. The Apostle Paul had this problem of the garment. As I read this morning, and I'm going to read again now, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, the Apostle Paul, uh, you know, when he was a Pharisee, he thought that he was pretty good. He was rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. He was covered with the robe of his own righteousness. Let's read. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he, ha he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But then he was converted. And notice verse 7, but what things were gained to me, everything that he's mentioned, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yes, indeed, I also count all things loss, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. You know, when Saul of Tarsus was afflicted, he was afflicted with blindness, wasn't he? But he met the Messiah on the road, and suddenly he went and he had his, his eyes healed, because now he could see, he could see that Jesus was the promised Messiah. In the book, uh, four testimonies, pages 88 and 89, Ellen White describes the remedies for Laodicea, and I want us to notice particularly the issue of the eye salve. She wrote, the true witness counsels us to buy of him gold tried in the fire, white raiment and eye salve. The gold here recommended as having been tried in the fire is faith and love. It makes the heart rich for it has been purged until it is pure, and the more it is tested, the more brilliant is its luster. Amen. The white raiment is a purity of character, 
the righteousness of Christ imparted to the sinner. This is indeed a garment of heavenly texture that can be bought only of Christ for a life of willing obedience. Now comes the eye salve. The eye salve is that wisdom and grace which enables us to discern between evil and good and to detect sin under any, any guise. God has given His church eyes that He requires them to anoint with wisdom that they may see clearly, but many would put out the eyes of the church if they could, for they would not have their deeds come to the light lest they should be reproved. The divine eyesalve will impart clearness to the understanding. So what are the three remedies that we can get in the divine pharmacy? Faith that works by love, the righteousness of Christ that is manifested in acts of love, and the eye salve that helps us see what our condition is so that we can seek healing. Those are the remedies for Laodicea. Unfortunately in the message to Laodicea, Jesus is outside the heart. Notice Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Here Jesus at the conclusion of the message to Laodicea says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Notice he doesn't knock down the door. He knocks. And then he says, if anyone, this is an individual thing, right? If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and what? And dine with him and he with me. Jesus, in other words, is coming at supper time, interestingly enough. Now, this morning we talked about the importance of motive didn't we? I want to read some of those statements again because really uh, works that are produced with the right motivation are works that God accepts because they're produced by Him. Works that come from our own efforts are rejected by God because they are artificially created by human beings. Let me read you several of these statements once again. The drunkard is despised and is told that his sin will exclude him from heaven. While pride, selfishness, and covetousness too often go unrebuked. However, these are sins that are especially offensive to God, for they are contrary to the benevolence of his character. She continues, He who falls into some of the grosser sins may feel a sense of his shame and poverty and his need of the grace of Christ, but pride feels no need, and so it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings he came to give. In Gospel Workers, page 111, Ellen White wrote, Many acts which, which pass for good works, even deeds of benevolence, will, when closely investigated, be found to be prompted by wrong motives. Remember the Pharisees when they gave alms? Oh, they gave alms. They would play the trumpet. Come and see. I'm giving poor people some things that they need. Good thing with the wrong motivation. She continues, Many receive applause for virtues which they do not possess. The searcher of hearts inspects motives, and often the deeds which are highly applauded by men are recorded by him as springing from selfish motives and base hypocrisy. Every act of our lives, whether excellent and praiseworthy or deserving of censure, is judged by the searcher of hearts according to the motives which prompted it. Sons and Daughters of God 171, every action derives its quality from the motive which prompts it. Child Guidance, page 201, every course of action has a twofold character and importance. It is virtuous or vicious, right or wrong, according to the motive which prompts it. She continues in another quotation, this is found in volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 279, it is not the greatness of the work, but the love with which it is done, the motive underlying the action that determines its worth. You see, God is less impressed with what we eat than why we eat it. God is more impressed with what we give, less impressed with what we give than why we give it. 
he's less impressed with what we do than why we do it. He's less impressed with what we wear than why we wear it. He's less impressed with where we go than why we go. You know Jesus frequented the uh, parties of the, of the publicans and sinners. Now we would say we should never hang out with these people, but was the, what was the motivation of Jesus? He went because he wanted to win souls. And so you know those people criticized him, you should not go there, but they needed to understand why Jesus went there. The motive determines whether the act is good or not. You know the Bible has examples of things that come from the heart. For example, Israel, when God said, build me a sanctuary, they needed raw materials to build the sanctuary. So Moses went out and he said, folks we need to contribute for the building of the sanctuary. You can read this in Exodus chapter 25. It says that the people, out of the kindness of their heart, it was, it was really something motivated by the heart. They brought and brought and brought until finally Moses said, don't bring any more. Wouldn't that be great in the Edmund church where the pastor would have to get up some Sabbath and say, folks, don't bring any more money. Please don't bring any more money. You know, the bank is going to go bust. That would be the day. You know, I had a, uh, an associate pastor in my church uh, who said, you know, there's plenty of money in this church, he used to say. It's all in people's pockets. <laughs> so, so the problem, folks, is not with our money. The problem is with the heart. The problem isn't with the wallet. The problem is with the heart. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's why the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, that God loves a cheerful giver. Do you remember when the widow brought her two mites to the sanctuary? Oh, the, the Pharisees, they were bringing their big donations, and you know they had used coins at that time, so they didn't use bills, so they would drop them from real high. Clang, 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 clang. The, the, the widow, she came, you know, just... So they couldn't even see that she was there and she gave her two mites. Jesus said she gave more than all of the rest. Yes. Not in quantity, but her motivation was right. Is it possible that a philanthropist might give a huge amount of money to build a hospital just because he wants his name to be attached to it? That would be a wrong motivation. Is it just possible that a church member would donate to purchase pews of the church as long as their name is at the end of the pew. <laughs> See, that's giving with a wrong motivation. That's the problem with Laodicea. In other words, the problem that we have, folks, is a heart problem. It's not a problem of actions. It's a problem about why we act the way we do. I want to read several statements now from Scripture about the issue of the heart. Matthew 15 verse 8, Jesus said, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Notice, the problem is with the fountain where the works come from, the motivation. Psalm 66 verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. We read Matthew 5 verses 27 and 28, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks on upon a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Let me ask you, where does adultery begin? Does it begin with wrong acting or wrong thinking? It begins with wrong thinking. So if you want to overcome adultery, it has to be overcome in the heart. That's where the root has to be taken out. Notice Matthew 6 verses 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. And now notice, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So the way that you manage your money is an issue of the heart. Notice Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 and 35. Matthew 12, 34 and 35. Jesus said to the Jews of his day, brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. I remember when I was growing up, once in a while my mom would wash my mouth with soap. 
because I said some words that I wasn't supposed to say. And uh, I remember one day I said to my mom, Mom, you're going about it the wrong way. You know, it does no good to wash my mouth with soap, wash my heart. So that when my heart is washed, my words will come out correctly. Notice Mark chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All of these things come from within and defile a man. Now you can externally look like you overcome these things, but really Jesus says all of these evil actions come from a bad heart, so what you need is to have your heart repaired, or transplanted rather. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6, and the Lord God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. God is in that heart transplant business. God does not put in, as I mentioned this morning, spiritual pacemakers, do bypass surgeries, change valves, or do angioplasty. The only type of surgery that God does is heart transplants. He will take out the heart of stone, come in and give us a heart of flesh. And then He will write His law in our hearts so that we do what the law requires, not because we have to, but because we want to. Psalm 37 verse 31 speaks about the importance of the heart once again. The law of God, the law of His God is in His heart. None of his steps shall slide. When is it that we don't slide? When the law of God is where? In our hearts. And the law is a reflection of whose character? Of Christ's character. Let's notice Psalm 40 and verse 8. Psalm 40 and verse 8. Here Jesus is speaking prophetically about the way that he would feel when he came to this earth. I delight to do your will. Did the Pharisees delight to do God's will? No. They, they did it as a matter of, of being obligated to do it. They said, I'll do it whether it kills me, whether I like it or not. I delight to do your will, oh my God. Why did Jesus delight to do his Father's will? Your law is within my heart. I read Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27 in our study this morning. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. See inside. I will take out the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. Notice that when Jesus comes into the heart, we don't do less, we do more, but we do it with a different motivation. Are you understanding the disease of Laodicea? I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. You see, when the law is in our hearts, Jesus won't tell us how to dress. He won't need to tell us how to dress. We will speak like Jesus. We will give like Jesus. We will act like Jesus. We will eat like Jesus. We will do everything like Jesus. Because we will do it because it comes from the heart. I want to read Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. This verse tells us who are the only ones that are going to be ready when Jesus comes. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The purity is not primarily purity of action, it is purity of heart, and when the heart is right, the actions are right. Ellen White wrote, this is found in Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 966, but the counsel of the true witness, this is the good news, does not represent those who are lukewarm as in a hopeless case. <laughs> so our, our, our situation is not hopeless, she says. There is yet a chance to remedy their state, and the Laodicean message is full of encouragement, for the backslidden church may yet buy the gold of faith and love, may yet have the white robes of righteousness of Christ, that the shame of their nakedness need not appear. Purity of heart, purity of motive, may yet characterize those who are half-hearted and who are striving to serve God and mammon. They may yet wash their robes of character and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. There is hope. 
as long as we apply the remedies. I want to end by reading a statement from Reunion Herald, February 25, 1902. This is what the church needs. A revival and a reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. Revival and reformation are two different things. Revival and reformation are two different things. Revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of the mind and heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. That's revival. But now notice, reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas and theories. It's a change in the way that you what? The way that you think. Once again, reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas and theories. But that's not all. Not only the way you think, she continues, of habits and practices. That is what you think, putting it into what? Into action. And then she states, reformation will not bring forth the good fruit of righteousness unless it is connected with the revival of the Spirit. Revival and reformation are to do their appointed work, and in doing this work they must blend. What's more important, revival or reformation? If you're revived and you're not reformed, you ain't be re been revived. Excuse the bad English. And if you are reformed by your own efforts and you haven't been revived, it's like a dead body trying to act and trying to live. Revival and reformation must go together. Revival is a resurrection from spiritual death. Jesus taking out the heart of stone, putting in a heart of flesh. And when that happens, when revival happens, when we resurrect from spiritual death, then the result will be reformation in our lives. But it will come naturally, it will flow naturally from the heart. The motivations for our actions will be the right motivations. And when the motives are right, God will accept our actions because He is producing it through the presence of His Spirit in our hearts. So is there hope for the Laodicean church? Yeah, there's hope for the Methodists and the Presbyterians. And you know, we usually think of them as Laodicean. You know, we're, we're Philadelphia. Well, rude awakening. These remedies must be applied by the remnant church in order to receive the latter rain and finish the work of God. Amen. May that be our experience.